The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Uh, this is a talk on user administration uh, trips, well, tips and tricks. Um, junior DBAs run into these problems, senior DBAs run into these problems. Um, let me start off with the normal Oracle Safe Harbor Agreement. Uh, once again, if I'm talking about something that we haven't actually shipped at a product, if it's in a DMR, or uh, like MySQL 5.7, uh, if I say it's blue, that might mean robin's egg blue to you, it might mean cobalt blue to me, it ends up being some other shade of color. So take stuff on new features with a grain of salt. Okay, a reading from the book of MySQL. MySQL stores accounts in the user table of the MySQL database. An account is defined in terms of a user name and the client host or host from which a user can connect to the server. The account may also have a password. Um, not exactly extremely reassuring for the security folks. Okay, most people in the Linux world, when they get on MySQL, they take MySQL in the database name, and MySQL is smart enough to take the username as the username connecting to the database. Uh, in many cases, this is good. I really don't recommend it. Uh, it's there for convenience. I like to lock things down a little bit further, but then I've come from a weird security government background. Um, you can usually override what your account is with the minus U. So you do MySQL minus U, the username you want to use, and away you go. They can be up to 16 characters long. We have our own little encryption algorithm, and we do support alternative character sets. I uh, had some admonitions about character sets yesterday. Uh, I'm going to go over those later, but uh, if you need the uh, Serbian dialect with the Serbian 2 collation, we support it, and it's out there. Okay. Creating accounts. When you create accounts in MySQL, there's usually two ways you can do it. Uh, you can use a create user or you can use a grant, grant statement. Uh, the second one, which is really for the, only the real diehards who love typing, you can actually get into the MySQL table database and into the user table and insert that stuff. Real messy, error prone, don't do that. Please use a GUI like MySQL Workbench or something like PHP MyAdmin. Uh, doing it by hand, uh, top line there. We log into MySQL as user root. Uh, by the way, root password, do not make it the same as the root password in your Linux boxes, unless you're a one-man shop. Uh, if you're a multiple-person shop, you don't want to be giving away your root passwords anyway. Uh, create a user. Here we have a user named Joe who's coming in at localhost. By the way, wildcards look like either an underline or the percent sign. So we're creating user Joe at localhost identified by a password. Uh, something else you can do is grant all privileges on database table to Joe at localhost with grant option. Uh, be very careful of this. If you give someone grant option, that means they get to go around and grant themselves their own privileges. Uh, works great in small shops, does not work in medium-sized shops, does not work on shops in shops with big egos. Okay, you can also do a create user and then come back and give that person privileges. Uh, if you want to be very, very, very specific of what you're doing for a user, um, you can grant reload and process privileges on a t database table to admin at a host, or you can just do a create user dummy at localhost. Okay. What happens over a couple of years at your average shop is you hire a guy named Joe, you fire a guy named Joe, you bring in another guy named Joe. Uh, Joe gets certain privileges, someone else come, named Joe comes in. Joe can't log in one day, so you go th through the user table 
and suddenly there's 15 entries for Joe, all with slightly different offset privileges. Uh, as I mentioned on this slide, usually you find out your boss, Joe, working from home does not have the same privileges as he's doing his year-end review of all the employees. Uh, tends to upset your bosses when they don't have the same privileges. Uh, unfortunately, there's no good tools for auditing this right now, so you have to go through it by hand. I need to write a script for that. Uh, something else you'll see if you go to a strange box and you go to you use the MySQL table, you select user, host, and password from the user table, and you'll see root from local hosts with this password, uh, root from 127.0.0.1 at this password, and you'll see root at a IP version 6 address, thankfully with the same password, and then you see a blank under user and a blank password. Uh, that's what we commonly call an anonymous account. Um, if you can get rid of it, please do. It's a big security bug. If you do have an anonymous account out there, take away every privilege you can from it. In some shops, you have it out there because someone needs to come on and do a quick and dirty and look up something real fast. Uh, but if you come in and you are in charge of a box and you want to lock it down, first thing to look for or anonymous anonymous. Uh, accounts. Now, on every row for a user, you'll see the username, password, and a, and a host, like you, you saw. And then you'll see a whole bunch of little columns. What are those columns? Well, they're the various privileges you can get on the box. Uh, select, insert, update, etc. Uh, these allow you to manipulate data and tables, depending on how many in which you have in certain combinations. Um, be careful. Some of these, like create table space, create temp table, um, and others for a vindictive user or something like that, they can actually flood the disk drives on your MySQL server. Um, great denial of service uh, trick there. The other thing you'll see is encryption. You can encrypt your MySQL traffic. Uh, you can also limit the number of questions, the number of updates, the number of connections, um, and the number of user connections, how many times they actually log in to a box. So if you have a real recalcitrant user and you want them on for one time, for one query, once a day, you can do it. Uh, very, very rarely done. Now, new as of 5.6 are plugins, an authentication string, and expiring a password. Uh, in the past, a lot of government agencies have shied away from MySQL because it doesn't have password control. Uh, we now have that. In 5.6 and 5.7, if you do a fresh install, it will force you to put in a root password, where in the past you can kind of get away with a quick carriage return. Pluggable authentication. Uh, now when you're trying to log in and the client comes through and the system sees that there's actually a plugin that you're supposed to be referencing, it will see what that plugin is. Um, if it specifies the plugin, it hands it off to the, the server that actually running that or the shared library that's doing that. Uh, the plugin will actually return a status indicating whether the user is permitted to connect or not. Now, with external authentication, uh, you can do things like LDAP, PAM, Windows authentication, uh, make it more of a bigger security package. It's no longer kind of like the lone wolf out there. We also introduced with 5.6 proxy users. Uh, it used to be you got a new user who had to use the database, you had to have a new account for them. Well, if you have an accounting department and they're always hiring and firing folks, it's easier just to set up one general accounting record that has all the privileges the accounting folks need, and then you just give a proxy login for the new temp accountant. So what sort of plugins do we have? Well, on the right-hand side, we have the native plugin, which everyone's been using for a long time, uh, 256 SHA, ClearText, uh, Socket Peer, and a test. So if you want to write your own, you can go with the test and see what you need to do to set up your own. 
Now, if you're an enterprise customer, meaning you're actually paying for MySQL, uh, we give you the plugins for PAM, Windows, and Enterprise Audit. If any of you are doing PCI compliance and you've had a hard time passing your audits, uh, take a look at the audit. It does basically what the Oracle audit does. It works with the Oracle audit vault, and it's great for credit cards. So, as I mentioned earlier on the, with the accounting example, uh, here we could come through and say, okay, create user, user at whatever host identified with that plugin, and say that they're going to be an accountant and create that user, and away you go. Uh, very simple, one step, you don't have to set up an account for everybody, and much easier. So what other things can you lock down with MySQL? Well, you can lock it down to the database level, which we had the example where you create u grant user star dot star, that means star means everything, or you can just say accounting dot star, which means everything in the accounting table, or accounting dot receivables, and that way you lock them down to that one table within that one database. We can also do it to the table level, like I just mentioned, the column level, so if you want the purchasing folks to be able to see what the vendor's name is and their phone number is, you can do that and lock everyone else out of there. We can also lock down events. Uh, MySQL has suffered uh, horribly on some very bad implementations of cron on boxes, so we came up with our own cron-like thing that we call events. Uh, stored procedures are kind of like sub-programs that you write yourself, you put in there, we can lock those down, and functions. So here's an example where we granted to some user at some host everything, all privileges, on this database to this table. And we can also say, okay, this person at this host, they can select and they can insert. They cannot do anything like a delete or a um, drop on this database and this table. Uh, by the way, if you're new to MySQL and new to being a DBA, uh, this pair of words down here at the bottom will be the bane of your existence for a while. All the information is stored in memory tables. So if you're typing along, you're trying to set up somebody's account, and you type in grant all to joe.schmo. whatever, and go try it, and they come back saying it's not working. Uh, what happened is you have not typed flush privileges which has told the system to reload the grant table. Um, you're laughing. Every senior DBA has done this at least twice a year since they've been playing with MySQL, and junior DBAs, it hits them a lot more often. Uh, something else you can do is grant select on column one, insert on column one and column two on this database.table. This is a good way to really, really lock things down. Once again, every junior DBA's bane of their existence. So you're there. I've had people tell me I shouldn't do this, but most audiences seem to appreciate it, so if you don't like it, let me know. So other database systems, you say, okay, I'm gonna set someone up as a DBA. What privileges, I just hit the DBA switch and away they have all the privileges for that. MySQL does not have any predefined ideas like that. Um, you can set it up by hand using an insert command. Uh, once again, I recommend MySQL Workbench. Uh, PHP MyAdmin does a reasonably good job. Uh, Workbench, if you want to see a demo of that, I can do that a little bit later. Uh, what's great is it has predefined roles for DBA, user admin, design, and replication. Uh, you can also set things down to the table and column level if you need to. Uh -huh. Going back to that, uh -huh. um, wouldn't proxies effectively give you that in the database, like proxies as roles, if you're granting permissions to a role or to a proxy? Um, could using proxies give you that idea of roles? Um, yes, unfortunately we don't have any predefined ones, so you'd have to define them and then define the reference person as a proxy. So we Yeah, you use Workbench to set up something for an accounting person and then reference the other people to that. 
Um, big rule to junior admins, uh, be stingy on handing out privileges. Um, because someone needs a quick and dirty truncate or drop table permission uh, because of a quick project they're doing now, does not mean that six months from now, right before you go off to a Thanksgiving dinner, that they don't drop the entire system database at the wrong time. Um, it's sometimes easier to do things for people than hand them the privileges and forget about it. Uh, by the way, that's the way, reason you do backups regularly and frequently. Uh, other things that happen is you give someone privileges to write temp tables or write stuff out, and they're not sure where it's writing up, and suddenly your machine starts swapping because it's running out of disk space, and there's little temp files and other things that aren't being done. The system starts thrashing badly. So be very, very careful. Yes, sir? In that picture, which one is the DBA? <laughs> uh, I've been in shops where either one of them could be the DBA. <laughs> One thing I used to do when I was a, a DBA or a consultant is I'd go through on a regular basis and dump everything into Excel and play various games and find out who had grant privilege, uh, who had drop privilege, and just switch, switch sort through there. Um, it's also nice to know especially who has shutdown privilege. Uh, you'll be surprised how someone reading something in a magazine will say, gee, I wonder if I have that privilege. Um, <laughs> uh, it happens. Uh, something else you can look at is triggers. Triggers work on events, like someone goes to drop something and you have a trigger that says, okay, they're getting rid of this row. I have a dummy table over here they don't know about. I'm just going to copy that data over there without them knowing it. Uh, it might be a millisecond or two delay in the overall aggregate of things. But when you find out that they just dropped 50,000 records from your accounts payable and the accountants aren't happy, it's easier to suck it back. Um, something that also might interest some of you, is time delay and replication. Uh, we learned this trick from Flickr. Uh, someone calls and says, oh my God, I just deleted all my pictures of grandma. And they're the only pictures we have. We don't have them the originals because they got burned down last week, got to help us. What Flickr was doing is they wrote their own time delay so that if you caught it within 24 hours, they could easily just scoop stuff off, off a replica. So if you have data that you don't want to have to literally pull off tape, set up time to delayed replication. The other thing is replication is you don't have to replicate everything. Uh, the more serious tables that you need, keep them out there. If you have stuff that changes, like a order catalog that you don't really publish more than once a quarter, maybe you only back that up on tape and don't worry about replicating it. Okay, summary. Uh, remember, flush privileges. When, my, when you go into log into uh, MySQL, the first thing it does is it checks to make sure your host is on the whitelist and then it checks the user and password. Uh, from then on, it looks for plugins and proxies. Uh, you can lock down more than the table level. You can actually go down to the column level. Uh, once again, I highly recommend Workbench. It's free. It works great. It's free. Uh, it does everything you, you really need. Uh, and big admonition, be stingy with privs. Um, Every, SO, every DB I've known that has a little bit of a tinge of being an SOB tends to keep their job more than the kind-hearted, extremely liberal database administration who lets everybody have every privilege. Um, I should have asked my friends from Sky to come in here. Um, this is the thing that Monty Winanis says he never sees. This is what MySQL is planning to do the next 18, 24, 36 months with the product. Um, we're going to make it more web and cloud centric. Uh, we're making a more pluggable architecture. Uh, think of pipes and similar things in the command line of Linux. Uh, we're going to have more NoSQL options. We're going to get a true data dictionary, which if you're doing cross database joins will make things a lot faster. 
Uh, we're doing more work with the SSD providers, and we're going to have true GIS. And sometimes later this summer, you should see some information on sharding that will make you all very happy for you folks who are trying to do the next Facebook. Uh, if you need to learn more on MySQL, uh, please hit mysql.com. Uh, downloads are out at dev.mysql.com. We aggregate blogs for the entire community at planet.mysql.com. If any of the enterprise tools that I've mentioned uh, appeal to you, you can try them free for 30 days. There's no time bomb in there. So if you go there for 40 days or 25 days, uh, things aren't going to mess up on your system. Um, they're, deliver they're from edelivery.oracle.com. Um, the one thing, if you have a couple spare days coming up, please try Enterprise Monitor. It is a very interesting tool and well worth the cost of the subscription. Enterprise Monitor. Enterprise Monitor. Uh, if you need training, we offer training. We're going to have a big, big, big conference in this, in this September. Um, if you want to talk to our engineers, the hot shots at Google, Twitter, the US Census Bureau, Playful Play, Ticketmaster, uh, Verizon, forget Verizon, they already know what you're saying, uh, Codership, uh, September 21st to 23rd in San Francisco. Uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of tutorials on the Monday, including some beginning stuff and some very advanced stuff. Uh, big warning is book your hotel early because they're going to have these things racing in the bay for the America's Cup. Uh, if you haven't seen these things doing 45 knots across the water, just literally feet away from the Embarcadero, it's quite a thrill. Uh, if you know or if you want to learn MySQL cheaply and elegantly and have your work checked by Mozilla's top DBA, uh, the Boston MySQL Meetup runs something called MySQL Marinate. They do a chapter a week out of the Learning MySQL book. They're halfway through their second batch. The first time they did it, they had 85, 86 people sign up to take the class. Uh, right now, they're in week five. Uh, if you want to scramble, you can catch up because the, the first couple chapters have minimal homework, and the chapters three and four have maybe five or six questions. Uh, it's a great way to learn MySQL. Um, they have an online chat group, and if you're in the Boston area, they get together and chat, I think, biweekly at a coffee house. Uh, once again, thanks for coming out. I'm Dave Stokes. Um, I'm david.stokes at oracle.com if you need to get a hold of me and you can't, figure, can't uh, remember what I said here. Uh, the slides are in slideshare.net slash Dave Stokes. On Twitter, I'm at Stoker. Uh, once again, warning, there's a movie starring Nicole Kidman named Stoker that's getting very, it's an independent movie, so it gets released around the country differently. Um, so if you see anything really exciting going on at, at Stoker's in there, it's probably not me, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, I want to thank, thank you all for coming out. I'm glad you folks are making um, use of this zero to DBA track. We'll see if we can expand it next year. And I'd like to open it up to questions. Yes, sir. Best practices. Uh, best, I'm f repeating for the camera since you're not on the microphone. Uh, best practices for infrastructure for DBAs in a shop. Um, run the latest version of MySQL that you can. Uh, 5.6 has a lot of great things out there. Um, have tools like MySQL Workbench. Um, if you're really serious about it, go out and buy the subscription so you get the tools like Enterprise Monitor. Uh, the query analyzer, so if something does go wrong and they're writing in PHP, .NET, or Java, you can actually figure out what lines of code are going bad and take it over to the developer and say, this is bad, don't do this. Um, other thing is make sure you're running fairly decent hardware. Um, every so often I go into a shop and you can see where they've gotten Gladys's from accounting's hand down box with the window ME sticker on it, and that's the production database box. Um, and generally, if you have that and some sort of caffeine, you can keep a DBA happy for literally years on end. So in addition to that, what's your take on MySQL on a VM itself? 
uh, my, my take of MySQL on a VM. Uh, Amazon seems quite happy with it. Um, I've played with it a little bit. My trouble is I'm an old-fashioned DBA. I like to know where my data is, and the idea that it could be in Cincinnati one day and Phoenix the next day kind of worries me. Um, the, the thing is, it's like a Kleenex. If you need to spin up a database and something goes wrong, you wad it up and throw it away. That's wonderful. Uh, if it's something under Sarbanes-Oxley and the government's saying, you need to keep this for 50 years, eh, not so much. Uh, I think you're going to see more and more hybrids where your marketing stuff is out there on some sort of virtual server that you don't really care about because it's ephemeral. You know, it's, you know, the entire sale lasted 17 minutes and f affected 44,000 people in one city. Yeah, yeah. Don't care about it. Tax records, accounting, health stuff is going to be somewhere on a platter you can go over and trip on. So. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for, for coming out um, and making the Zero to DBA track very successful. And see you back next year. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support 
uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. Cloudstack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects. And there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloudstack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones it extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astros based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astros or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astros. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Astris, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. 
you can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked.